in my whistle. Thank you. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a joy to get to worship with you this morning. Um, just for those of you who uh, have been here a few times in the past, you know that more often than not, I'm usually... Uh, doing most of the leading and singing. And I just wanted to give you a heads up this morning. Uh, Allison and my mom, Elaine and uh, Dan, are going to be helping out as well and leading. And I just wanted to be up front. None of us are up here to put on a show for you, right? The only reason we're up here is uh, to help you lead you into a place where you uh, can, with uh, confidence and comfort, worship our God. So if any one of us is up here singing and you see words on the screen, and you feel comfortable, we hope you'll feel free to sing with us. Let's begin our time by doing that together and singing of the great mercy of our God. Would you stand? Merciful God, we stand in your presence this morning and we have no delusions about who we are. We have no right to be here. And yet, by your mercy, here we are. May those two truths be close to our hearts this morning, both the depth of our sin and the infinitely deeper riches of your grace to us. May that be the fuel that feeds the fire of our worship this morning. And may your Holy Spirit be the power that brings something miraculous to pass in our midst as we lift your name high today. We pray these things in the name of our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Good morning. My name is Jonah Wilson, the associate pastor here at the church. I'd like to welcome you here with us to worship this morning. If you're a guest with us today, we'd like to welcome you in particular, and we would ask that you fill out the flap in your bulletin, this little connection card. You can drop that off in the offering plates as they come around, or you can drop it off at the back information desk in uh, the lobby. I will be back there after the service. And we'll have the opportunity to connect with you and, and give you a gift as well. Coming up this week at the church, we have lots of different opportunities for events that are happening. This is the week where we have a big launch into many of the, the different things. So you'll see that the men's prayer breakfast, grief share, salt and light, the preschool playgroup, some different women's Bible studies, all of these things are going to be starting up this week, and these will continue on weekly afterward. Starting the following week on Sunday, and then running into the rest of the week is growth groups as well. And we have the opportunity to enjoy these opportunities for fellowship and growth together as the body. If you have any questions or if you're interested in any of those, please reach out to me, Paul, uh, Bonnie, whoever it may be, and we, we are, we'll be happy to get you more information about how to get involved with some of those ministries. Thank you. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians. It's uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 20. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Would you stand and continue to worship? I hope you believe what Mark just read, that we're citizens of God's people, members of his family. Let's remind ourselves of where we find our worth, where we find our identity, from the one who calls us his own through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love.
what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Sing with me, there is a hill. There is a hill I cherish Where stood a precious tree The emblem of salvation The gift of Calvary
deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His seated. A few years ago, um, I was grappling with uh, the ways the church has failed. Not this church, but the church throughout history and across the world. The ways that we have fallen short, that we've uh, besmirched the name of Jesus. And I, I sat down, and I started to write a poem uh, to God, really a lament, uh, just trying to deal with this. And the most amazing thing happened. As I was writing it, I realized something about us and something about God that had never really sunk in before. Um, this morning, as we think about the mysterious grace of God's choice, choosing us of all people, uh, I wanted to bring that poem to you. Um, and share that with you. I've asked my mom to read it this morning. It's entitled, Imperfect Bride. <clears throat> Gracious Father, Sovereign Lord, how long must we wait for this refining to finish? How long will you leave us to squabble and stagger, <laughs> spinning our tires, a flickering lamp on a stunted lampshade? Our weakness is no secret to you. You made us and formed us. You called us and keep us. You know full well to expect nothing better. So you promise your Holy Spirit. You promise to change us, to guide us, to lead us. You promise to finish the work you began. But if our hearts are like water in your hands, what could keep them from turning to you? If you could write your law on our spirits, why do we stray so far from your commands? If it is you who causes the old to pass away, 
Why does it linger? If it is you who raises Christ, or raises to new life in Christ, why do we still bear the stink of death? Act, for you are able. Take control for the glory of your name. We are your body. We cannot resist you. We are your slaves and cannot stand against you. Make us move as you would move us. Make us long for what you desire. But you, you said you would cause us to walk in your ways, but what you cause, nobody can thwart. How can we wander if you direct our steps? Lead us where you want us, so that you may be worshipped as you alone deserve. Yet I know that one day your bride will stand, not dressed in rags, but in radiant white. She will be a jewel of your splendor, a bright star of your kingly crown. Why must we wait, my God, my lover? Why withhold the raiment you promise? But, O oh, my soul, praise the name of your Redeemer, for he has clothed you in purest white. In finest linen he has draped you. What greater glory could be given than this wretched betrayer, this unfaithful bride, treated with all the favor of the beloved, even while her faults are clear to see? What greater tale could be told of our God than that he would choose such a bride for himself? How I long for her faults to be mended. But how praiseworthy is he who has called her beautiful, saying, this is the one I love. I would have no other. Let's pray as the ushers come forward. God, how is it? How is it that we of all people should profit while Christ, the Son of God, is crucified? This is a mystery to us, and it is a mystery that we can never fully fathom the depths of. May we never stop trying, Lord. Let us drink deeply of the mystery that you would choose us, you would bless us, you would call us. May what we do now in giving back to you be in our small way, an echo of the grace that you have shown us, of the generosity you have shown us. May we do so gladly with joyous hearts, grateful hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would take these offerings and bless them. Use them to your glory, for the good of your kingdom, for the honor of Christ Jesus. We pray these things in his name.
I'm very hesitant to um, to mention people from the pulpit too much for fear of offense or either by neglect or by overexposure, but uh, I really do feel like I would be negligent uh, today uh, if I did not uh, encourage you to do the very thing that you've been doing, which is to rejoice with Paul and Natalie Schmidt. Yes, they're... Um, uh, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I don't know which of those is actually easier to do, but I do know that many of you prayed and God in his sovereignty uh, granted uh, the blessing of a beautiful little baby girl, uh, Harkin with an I, H-A-R-K-I-N, Harkin Joy, nine pounds, six ounces, um, 36 inches tall. I can't remember the height. <laughs> she was tall. Uh, she's beautiful. And I know that Paul and Natalie appreciate your prayers for them. Let's pray right now, please. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Um, prayer is a mystery to us, and how you answer prayer is a mystery to us. And in this particular case, we come thanking you that you have um, given Paul and Natalie this beautiful daughter, and we ask now for your grace as they seek to raise her. We here at the church have been blessed by all of these babies, and... <laughs> And we're very thankful, and we are burdened by it. It, it. it comes with this great sense of joy and this great sense of responsibility. And we would pray that we would sense both of those deeply. And we also are burdened for those who find themselves, like Paul and Natalie, longing to have a baby and unable to for whatever reason. And we would extend... Uh, our prayers and our love to them and pray for your mercies to be extended to them. We come this morning and we do not leave at the door our burdens and concerns, uh, everything from hurricanes uh, to crops. Uh, we're thankful that you allowed the rain to come this morning. We see that as a gift from your hands and uh, pray that <laughs> in the rain uh, we would find a reason for which we could give you worship and praise. As we open your word now, we pray that you would make it become alive to us by your spirit and that you would indeed speak to each one of us, whether we believe your word or not, that your spirit would take the truth of the word and make it become alive uh, to us and uh, transformative. Do the work that <laughs> do the work you need to do in each of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of First Corinthians, please. The book of First Corinthians, chapter one. Book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You remember Charlie Bucket? Charlie Bucket? Willy Wonka, Charlie Bucket. Charlie was a poor boy who lived with his widowed mother and his grandfather Joe. And good trivia question, his grandmother Josephine. And Charlie one day happened to be one of five people who opened a Wonka chocolate bar and found uh, the golden ticket. A gentleman in Paraguay had said he found the fifth ticket, if you remember the story, but he was a multimillionaire and had managed to fake a ticket. Charlie actually found the fifth ticket, and the fifth ticket 
ultimately ended up with Charlie being handed the reins uh, as he soared over the city and over the factory. Uh, he was handed the reins of the Wonka chocolate factory. Who gets the golden ticket? Who's handed the golden ticket? Have you been given the golden ticket? Have you? Have you been handed? Were you one of the ones that opened the Wonka chocolate bar and found inside it the golden ticket? Who gets it? We're asking the question, who gets the good life? Who's handed the good life? Who's provided the good life? Who gets the golden ticket? And we've talked about the fact this is the seventh and eighth sermons. So one more. This is the seventh and eighth sermons about the good life. And we've talked about the fact that the good life comes to us, is discovered by us through wisdom. Wisdom is the connector. Uh, it, wisdom is the coupler. If you're looking for the good life and asking how do you discover it, and I believe each one of us is looking for the good life, then wisdom is the means by which we find it. I believe every one of us have echoes of the good life in our minds and hearts. If we look at this thing theologically, biblically, we think about the good life. What was it like? We think about the life as it's described in the Garden of Eden. We go back to Adam and Eve and they walk in the garden in the cool of the day and God fellowships with them there and life is good. Uh, they have food that's unfathomable to us, available to them. They have the whole of the earth and they're charged to govern it, to farm it, to uh, some of your translations say the husbandman it, to care for it, to steward it. They have each other. There's a degree of innocence in their lives. There's no sin. There's no darkness. There's no jealousy. There's no envy. There's no murder. All of that life is good. Life is as it was created and meant to be. And darkness descends like a veil because the enemy comes and he offers another version of the same thing. He comes and he says, there is a good life, but you're not living it. Because God, in fact, is keeping a secret from you. He, he's hiding something from you. He's really obscuring the good life from you. There's a way that you can find it, and I'm offering that way. And if you'll take it, you'll re really discover the good life. And they take it, and darkness descends, and it doesn't take long. In fact, it is their own children that end up demonstrating the depth of that darkness when Cain lures his brother Abel out into the field and kills him in secret, but it's really not in secret because God says, the blood of your brother cries to me from the ground. What have you done? What have you done? But there's remnants of it. There's remnants of that that echo in our hearts and our lives. I got up early this morning. I got up early and I went out into the porch and I heard something. I, I couldn't believe it. I heard something. I had not heard it, but I, I thought I knew what it was. It was called thunder. I had not heard it for so long, but I heard it. I heard it and it's something resonated and there's something when we think about the good life, we pursue it, we want it, we long for it because there's a remnant of that left in our lives. Our hearts are hungry. We want the good life. We thirst because water exists. And all kinds of theologians, theologians a lot smarter than me, uh, Augustine and Blaise Pascal, they all wrote about this longing that exists in the heart of all humanity. And we seek to satiate that longing, that longing for the good life, which is ultimately a longing for God himself. And we try to find it. We try to discover it. We try to unearth it. And we do that in all sorts of ways. And Paul says, ultimately, we make idols, and we want those idols to bring us the good life. We believe they are the way. They are the vehicle. They are the golden ticket to the good life. 
But they have ears and they cannot hear, and they have eyes and they cannot see, and they have mouths and they cannot speak, and hands and they cannot work. And Paul says in Romans 1, the very things that we seek to worship end up being our demise because idols cannot satisfy that longing. They indeed increase it, and the hunger and the thirst only grows. And it's like a person who finds himself on the wrath in the Pacific. What's the one thing you do not drink? Water, water, everywhere, and not a drop to drink. And we try to consume it, and it only makes us thirsty. We try to eat it, and it only makes us hungry. And we go on and on looking for the good life. Pascal wrote, What else does this craving, this helplessness proclaim? But there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that remains is the empty print and the trace of it. He tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in those things, things that are not there to help and fill what he cannot discover. There's this infinite abyss in his life, which can only be filled with an infinite object, which is the Lord himself. And so wisdom is the way of looking at the world and our understanding <laughs> of, <coughs> of the world and how do we fit in it. And wisdom is what connects our lives with life. What is life about? What does life mean? What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? Wisdom tells us the answers to those questions captures our imaginations, which is connected to our desires, which drive our will. And so we have this wisdom come to us, but not all wisdom comes from the right sources. And we have to decide what is the reliable guide to us to provide the wisdom that's going to lead us to the good life. And there are all kinds of voices out there telling us what the good life is, all kinds of ideas that begin to capture our imagination and describe for us what the good life is. The good life is being wealthy. That's it. That's the good life. If you can get wealth, the wisdom says, if you can find wealth or get wealth any way you can get it because ultimately wealth leads to the good life. Pleasure at any cost, no matter what the cost, pleasure at any cost is, this form of wisdom says, the golden ticket that connects to the good life. So you get pleasure at any cost. You sacrifice your family, you sacrifice your very self, you sacrifice all to discover what is, what is wisdom telling you, what is your wisdom telling you is the means by which you can couple your life to that which is called the good life. The Bible has a way of describing life, and the Bible has a way of understanding the world in which we live, and the Bible has a way of talking about this sense of wisdom that couples us to the good life. And Paul has written to this church in Corinth, and they're all about wisdom, they're all about discovering the good life, and Paul is concerned about this church because they've been listening to some other sources other than the gospel, and that is driving this hunger, this desire for the good life, and is filling that hunger, and is taking them in the wrong direction, and Paul is bringing a corrective to that. And the Jews wanted wisdom, and the, the Greeks wanted wisdom, and Paul says the wisdom of God is ultimately found in the person of Christ and in the work of Christ, which is the gospel. Uh, they are a people, these people that live in Corinth, that are a lot like us, uh, who have an idea that the people who have the good life are the people that we see in grocery stores, on magazine covers, or we see on television, or we go to the theater, or people that have significant influence in our world. They're the people with the good life. We're, we're people who get taste of the good life. Some of you go to Sam's to shop, and you go specifically 
to eat it sounds you you won't admit it you won't but you go there to eat and so you move from food sampling station to food sampling station because you're cheap and you don't want to buy food and so this is a way to have a cheap lunch and you nibble on it and you nibble enough and you're like oh I'm full now and there's this nibbling taking place and and Paul's calling them to eat of the gospel and to partake of the gospel and he says that this wisdom that they need to have comes from the Lord and they'll discover in this wisdom a satisfaction that they have yet to find and that they themselves are an example of this wisdom that connects them to the good life. Uh, it's, it's sort of a difficult text, but we're going to plunge head on into it. And we're going to begin in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Consider your calling. Paul wants them to think about this. Think about this, Paul says. And he wants them to think about themselves, and he wants to think about themselves in light of the fact that they have been people who have been responsive to the gospel, the gospel of Jesus, the message of Jesus. Consider your calling, Paul said. Think about this, brothers. And as you think about it, now many of you were wise according to worldly standards. And we talked about this last week. What is the source for your wisdom? Where do you get it from? Where do you go find your wisdom? Do you get it from Amazon? Today, Prime, where do you go buy your wisdom? hy V, where do you get it? Not many were powerful, nor were many of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Three points, and they seem a little unrelated, but we'll try to connect them all. It's the scandal of grace and the way God works and what happens. Those are the three points. The scandal of grace, the way God works, and what happens. Three points out of this text. And remember, it's about who gets the golden ticket? Who gets the wisdom that connects and leads them to the good life? Who is it that does that? If the true good life is found in Jesus, as Paul would argue, then who gets the golden ticket. Now, Paul is addressing this because the Corinthian culture, much like our culture, has decided that this wisdom, this good life, comes to people ultimately who deserve it. You get the good life because you deserve it. Now, we, we know that's not always true. We, depending on how we define a good life, we look out and we say, wow, there are people that don't deserve it that have a good life, depending on how you define the good life, the blessed life, the abundant life. We'll talk about that. But we look and we say, those are the people that don't deserve it. But ultimately, we think there's some sort of justice system that sort of functions in our world and... It gets us aggravated when it doesn't function, but it does seem to function, and we have this idea, this wisdom that says the good life will come to you if you work hard and maybe if you're gifted enough, if if you get what you deserve, if it, it will come, it will come. Just hang in there, keep working, keep trying, do your best, and and ultimately the American dream can be yours. Because we would define the good life by the American dream. We would say having a car, having a home, having a job, having health insurance, um, having health. Those are the kind of things that make the good life. And it is a good life. Of that there is no denial. It is a very good life. For which we are most grateful, I trust. But it doesn't necessarily equate that 
the American dream life and the good life are equal. <laughs> because otherwise, the people who live in poverty-stricken countries, to which we may send a missionary, and we go and proclaim the gospel to them, and we say, through the gospel, you can have the good life. Surely what we're not saying to them is, through the gospel, you can have a house and a car and health insurance and a good job. That's not what we're saying, is it? I hope not. Because the Bible would not say that that is the good life. It does, in a sense, but it doesn't. You say, that's what we love about you as a pastor. You just <laughs> waffle constantly. Well, Paul comes and he says, who is it that gets this wisdom? And who is it that ultimately gets the good life? And Paul says the Corinthians are, have their own idea. They are these wise people, the people who are insightful and thoughtful and intelligent and smart and understand the world and life around them. They're the influencers. I hate that term. We, it's, a now, it's a modern term now that we talk about people that, that are through social media become influencers and they should never be influencers. No way should they be influencers, but that's what we call them or perhaps that's what they call themselves. Maybe that's what they call themselves. They're influencers. They determine how you dress and they determine where you vacate and those kinds of things. Well, Paul said there are these influencers, movers and shakers. He uses this word, consider your calling. Not many, and Paul keeps repeating this phrase, not many of you were wise, according to a worldly standards. Not many were powerful. And again, the Greek word there means an influencer, a person who, who influences the culture around them. Not many were of noble birth, uh, born into significance, from the right family, with the right family tree, with the right family name. Now, we would look at those people, and we would say those people have significant cash value in our particular culture. They carry a lot of weight. They carry a lot of water in our particular culture. They're influencers. And we may even say that these people are the people, indeed, that have the good life, Right? They're movers and shakers. They're powerful people. They're the people that people look to for answers. They're influencers. They come from the family names of uh, the names of people that we would look up to. They are the right people. It's like choosing the people for the original seven. You should be able to name the original Mercury astronauts. You absolutely shouldn't have to think about it. You should name them. How tall could the original seven be? No taller than five foot. You should know this. Five 11. All of them had to be what? Out of the military, and they all had to be test pilots. All of them had to be, uh, have a minimum of 1,500 hours flying time. All of them had to have a bachelor's degree. All of them had to be in perfect physical health. Because by virtue of those resume fillers, they qualified. Paul comes and says, these are significant resume fillers, wise, influential, noble birth, that would seem to be what is necessary in order to get the good life. And Paul comes and says, that's what traditional wisdom would say. But then you come along to the cross and the scandal of God's grace, and it does not say that at all. In fact, if grace is not scandalous to you, then you simply do not understand grace. Now, what some thought Paul was saying, even in the first century, was this. Celsus writing this about Christians. Let no one educated, no one wise, no one sensible draw near. For these abilities are thought by Christians to be evil. But if you are ignorant, uneducated, a child, then come boldly. Now, he is speaking sarcastically. By the fact that they themselves admit that these people are worthy of their God, they show that they want and are able to convince only the foolish, only the dishonorable, his word, not mine, only the stupid, only slaves, only women, only children. These are the kinds of people that are the fertile ground for the gospel. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, Paul is right. 
The only people that the gospel really appeals to, the only people that really are believers, the only people that would dare believe this story are the people that are not thinkers, the people that are uneducated, the people that are poor, the people that are psychologically needy. Those are the people that the gospel finds its seedbed in. They find the golden tick, the golden ticket. They're the, they're the way that you get this wisdom that the gospel offers. Now, is that true? Is that true? Is, that, is he correct in that evaluation? Well, there is a sense in which that's true. There's a, w- a sense in which Paul is rejoicing that when the gospel came, it came and it did find an enormous response among slaves and among the poor. And Jesus, when he came preaching his gospel, he came pro- pro- proclaiming his gospel to the people that no one assumed he would proclaim his gospel to, which were the poor and the needy and the sick and the disenfranchised and the prostitutes and the thieves and uh, the kind of people that normally good people do not associate with. Correct? But it's also true that the gospel was proclaimed among the wealthy, and they responded, and the educated, and they responded. Indeed, many of the slaves in the first century were not what we imagine slaves to be. They were often more educated than their masters. In fact, they were the educators in the home. But Paul comes and he says, the point of God's wisdom, the thing that opens the door to the good life is the fact that God's wisdom comes and is scandalous because it comes and it says, whosoever will may come. The good life is available to all. And that grace is scandalous. If you don't believe that it's scandalous, then how do you respond to this statement? That Christians believe that nice, moral people who die without Jesus are lost forever. But the worst criminal in history who dies as a repentant person trusting in Jesus can be saved for all eternity. Is that not scandalous? It is to me a little bit. You know, the word is on the street, and I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not true. Jeffrey Dahmer, supposedly one of the most vile, evil, wicked human beings in recent history in his jail cell came to faith in Christ. (laughs) Now, that's not what I want to see. I want to see Jeffrey Dahmer burn in hell forever and ever and ever. But the scandal of grace that seems so offensive is that God in his grace comes and opens the door of salvation to whosoever will, whosoever will repent, whosoever will turn, whosoever will cast themselves upon the mercy and grace of God. That's not the way we want it to work. We want it to work the way we like it to work, which is nice, kind, good people who are kind of religious, but even if they don't involve themselves in a religion, but treat each other nice, give cookies to the new neighbor, return the doggy that's wandering the streets, uh, feeds a child warm cookies that's hungry, that uh, rejects Jesus, rejects the gospel, say, I don't believe that's hocus pocus. It's just a bunch of old historical gobbledygook. I don't believe that. But when they die, we want to believe they go to heaven. But that's not the gospel. (laughs) The gospel is that people who are dark and sinful and, and wretched, Joseph prayed it we sang it wretched come to Christ and Christ in his grace and his mercy forgives them and cleanses them and so the golden ticket is offered to whosoever will the veil was torn on Jesus that day you remember the veil being torn you remember that you remember that the veil was torn from what by the bottom when God tore the veil in the temple which is a highly symbolic thing that that this is now open God didn't just poke a hole did he could have poked a hole (laughs) so just certain people could get through (laughs) it's just a hole but he didn't poke a hole he did what he tore the veil wide open Nicodemus thief and a liar and a cheat and a traitor Jesus said I want to have supper with you 
Grace has come to this house this day. Nicodemus says, I repent of my sins. I cast myself on your mercy. It's scandalous. It's scandalous who gets to go to heaven. It's scandalous the way God forgives sin. It's scandalous the way God pours out his grace upon humanity. Grace is scandalous. Paul said, God in his wisdom, the people that can discover the good life are not the people that the world may say we would normally think would get the good life. Well, look at the way God works. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And again, Paul repeats this. God chose... Um, it's the word from which we get elect. God elects, God chooses what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing the things are. Um, God chose that which is foolish and the world ashamed the wise. These are the cho uh, choices that God makes. And Paul says, uh, he uses two words. He uses this idea of shame. And we, we think of shame, we think of that feeling of embarrassment we get uh, when, uh, I don't know, we've been talking to somebody for uh, half an hour. Uh, I recently was talking to somebody, uh, you know, here in the office, talking, talking, talking. Then I went in the, uh, the bathroom and I saw this gob of food on my face. And it's like, oh, man. Now, the good thing is, if it was my wife, she would not know it. Because <laughs> Connie doesn't notice anything. But I think this person noticed. It's not that, that's not the meaning of the word. It, it is a word that is used often in the Old Testament. And Paul also used the word nullify. He used it throughout the book of Corinthians to bring to nothing. He used that word. Both those words connected. Paul is saying something. It is an eschatological word. It is a word about the way things are going to be. And Paul is saying ultimately the golden ticket comes and it comes to those who don't deserve it. They get it by grace. And God works it in such a way that they're going to now enter into. They're now going to experience. They're now going to come into this great and glorious work that God is doing in the world in which he is inevitably, finally, completely going to do away with all of these things that have entered into the world as brokenness. It is, uh, it is, the, uh, it is the interjection of, Paul is interjecting this whole idea of hope. The good life comes. The good life is now experienced. We now experience the good life because if we come to God in Christ, it is the removal of our guilt and our shame before God and before others. It's, it's the forgiveness of our sins. It is the hope of eternity. It is the joy of knowing when we die we'll go be with Christ. It is the fellowship of the Father. All those things are now brought to us, and it is the hope that ultimately and finally Paul says that the world is going to be made right. And we need to allow our imaginations to be stirred by that reality once again. And we have anchored ourselves too firmly in the terra firma and it's kind of a two-edged sword we we need to think more correctly about the world and the way God has created and the good earth and how God has given it to us to steward for his name's glory and to to enjoy to his glory all of those things are absolutely true but in doing that we've swung the pendulum I think too far and we've lost sight of the hope of that which is yet to come and we don't attend funerals anymore. Don't be offended by this. Please don't be offended by this. We don't go to funerals anymore. We go to life celebrations. Over and over, I read the obituaries in the paper, and the invitation is, come to Harry Smith's celebration of life, and we're going to laugh together and, and rejoice together over all the wonderful things that Harry Smith did in our world. Should we? Yes. 
But should we not also grieve our hearts be broken that Harry Smith is no longer here? Our world is broken. Death has come. But Paul says, be encouraged. The good life means not only forgiveness and joy and fellowship with Christ now, but Jesus is going to make the world right. Our imaginations are no longer captured by hope. They are now captured by lust. Both involve longing, but the difference in them is significant. The good life is the life that is now, but it is indeed the life that is to come. And Paul says the way God works is through Christ, and he's going to bring the good life to us. Finally, Paul says that the ones who get the good life are the ones that enter into grace and discover God's mercy through grace and discover this great and glorious hope not only in this life but the life which is to come and as a result of all of those things they find their boasting their rejoicing in Christ no human being might boast in the presence of God Paul says if it's on account of our good works and if it's on account of what we've done, if it's on account of our pedigree, then we can boast. But it's not. It's all on the basis of grace. And it's because of being in Christ, in Christ, Paul says, who is the very wisdom that comes to us from God. He's the connecting rod between the head of the piston and the crankshaft is Jesus. He brings to us righteousness, which is a right standing with God, sanctification or holiness, which is right living, and redemption, which is freedom from sin and bondage. So that ultimately, if we're going to boast, we're going to boast in the Lord. So the invitation to the good life is the invitation to praise and worship and glory. And then the person who truly experiences this grace and truly experiences this forgiveness and truly experiences this relationship with Jesus enters into the good life and entering into that good life results in praise and adoration. Look at the woman who washed the feet of Jesus. It's no wonder that she washed the feet of Jesus because she knew something about his grace undeserved. Um, You come into a place and people are praising and worshiping God It's no wonder if they know what that grace is about. I love the story where Jesus heals a man who's not been able to walk, and Jesus heals him, and he gets up, and he does what? He goes walking and leaping and praising God. It's no wonder that he would praise God. So if you want to know whether or not you truly understand the good life, the good life as Jesus promises it, the good life of forgiveness, good life of the presence of the Spirit, the good life of hope, all in anticipation of the experience of the ultimate good life and fellowship with him as he makes things right again like they used to be back in the garden. If you want to know whether you really know that, and whether you really experience that, then demonstrate, show me what your praise life is like. Because if it's not, if it's not a powerful moving thing in my life, it shows, it demonstrates whether I want to admit it or not. If I'm not grateful, if I'm not thankful, if I don't worship the Lord, it shows I have no clue of the scandal of my own experience of God's grace. It's like I get it because I got it because I deserve it. Unlike Charlie, unlike Charlie, I don't find it in a Wonka bar. Charlie finds it in a Wonka bar. He doesn't deserve it. It's not that way with me. I get it because Wonka brings it to me and he delivers it to me in my house and he says, yes, I've been watching you. You deserve this. Here's the golden ticket. Well, I'm not going to thank Wonka for bringing me the golden ticket. There's no no doubt why I got the golden ticket. I've done all the right things. I'm the right kind of guy to get the golden ticket. 
But if I find it, if I discover it by grace as a gift, I'm so grateful in my heart for the reception of it. And that begins to demonstrate the operation of the wisdom of God in my life because I'm beginning to discover what the true good life is. And these other things begin to slough off. Not immediately, they begin to slough off as I discover the true good life that's found in Christ. Scandalous grace let's pray please would you stand with me let's pray our heavenly father we pray that you would show us the depth and height and breadth of your grace We, as the body of Christ, sometimes perpetuate the exact opposite. We manufacture Christian superstars, people that we believe are the ultimate. And then we're shocked when they fall and their lives crash and burn. You will suffer no other gods. Any good that we do any good that we know is a gift. It's a gift. It comes to a gift. Help us to see the power of grace in our lives. And I pray that you would indeed call to the person who is drinking the water of the world and finding it salty and rather than satisfying them if they were honest it is killing them I pray that they would drink deeply of the water of your grace you offer it help us to drink it and father we as a church body don't get it right all the time but we exist in your grace. And I do pray that one thing we would get right is that we would be a people who resonate with the praise of your glory, who perpetuate thanksgiving for your mercies. Dismiss us now with the power and presence of your spirit. May we go and live today in your grace. May we go today and live in your forgiveness. May we go today and live in your hope, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.